we are about nine months in to this Ukraine conflict, and you've been very outspoken about it. Could you just give your uh, opinion about where things are at right now and how you see the role of the EU in this uh, in this conflict and what role it's playing? Yeah, I mean, look at it. It's really terrible. We are, as you say, nine months in, well over 100,000 Ukrainian deaths. Millions have left the country, which is absolutely in devastation. Added to that, tens of thousands of Russians' li lives lost and an economic crisis in Europe now where the citizens face a decision between heating or eating this winter in part because of the impact of the war and the self-imposed Europeans shooting themselves in the foot by imposing sanctions on Russia, refusing to buy Russian gas and instead buying uh, US LNG at four times the price that the US is paying for it. So you've U European industry now shutting down, uh, following the energy to either China or US with the subsequent impact on jobs. So it's an absolute nightmare for people, particularly in Ukraine, uh, also uh, Russians involved in the war, and then, of course, the citizens of Europe as well. And has the European Union analysed its strategy in this affair? Because its strategy was, let's arm Ukraine to defeat Russia, and let's impose sanctions to defeat Russia. And nine months on, we actually have a situation where the EU has given more money to Russia this year than any other money any time before because of the elevated prices in uh, energy and so on. We've had the ridiculous situation of countries buying outside the EU, buying oil and gas from um, yeah. the Russia and then selling it back to the EU. I mean, it's I, I'm laughing, but it's actually not funny because it's the living standards of Europeans that are paying for this madness. And meanwhile, there are probably elderly people in Ireland and in other places who are, you know, afraid to turn on their heating. But they're at the same time, they're kind of being told that they're making a sacrifice for Ukraine by dying or freezing to death this winter, which is just lunacy. So has the European Union rethought its strategy? Short version, no. Uh, longer version, well, it's a work in progress. So we've seen across the of Europe growing protests in a number of member states, in Italy and so on, against NATO, against the cost of living in France, in the Czech Republic, many different uh, outcomes there. People very upset about what's going on. There's certainly been cost of living demonstrations in Ireland as well, not necessarily linked to the war. Has that resulted in Europe moving and calling for peace? Well, the short version is no, it hasn't. But actually on the recent vote, which was to declare Russia a state sponsor of terrorism, which was patently ludicrous, seen as Europe doesn't have that legal definition anywhere. The US has, and even the US isn't mad enough to uh, agree with that, uh, but actually the European Parliament did. But interestingly, 17% of the members didn't um, agree with that, which is a big jump forward, considering there was only 13 of us who opposed the original um, you know, vote. So I think ch things are changing, but sadly, slowly, they're throwing a lot of money into the energy situation. They're kind of hoping that uh, people will mosey through this winter, but I'm not sure they will. The economic impacts now are beginning to be felt quite severely. Right, right. And, you know, Politico had an article uh, not too long ago, I believe it was uh, just under a week ago, talking about how top EU officials were starting to resent the United States for profiting off of uh, the war going on in Ukraine. And uh, one of those for folks was uh, Joseph Burrell, the foreign policy chief. Uh, what is the state of the EU right now? Because it feels like you've called this war a proxy war on Russia led by the United States. You said quite clearly in part in uh, the European Parliament that oftentimes it feels like you're you're all reporting for duty whenever Zelensky says he needs something. Uh, do you find that this is changing or do you feel like the EU is still almost acting as a servant for uh, a U.S. Uh, a sponsored war? 
I think so many people are scraping their heads, scratching their heads all across the world going, what the hell is Europe doing? I mean, we had the privilege of going on a visit to Pakistan in the last month or so. And people in Pakistan were saying to us, it's really sad how Europe has just abandoned its independence and just rolled in behind the US and so on. But I mean, clearly the statements from Burrell show they're very slow learners. I mean, for God's sake, this is exactly what we were saying when the war started. It's patently obvious. I suppose what is interesting is that they've allowed that emerge now into the public domain, which shows that the pressure is beginning to bear and these slow learners are beginning to take note. Now, you do have different forces at work inside the European Union. You have the old, I suppose, powerhouses, Germany, France and so on, the old um, colonial powers that used to be there, Spain, Portugal, Western Europe. And then you have the Eastern European countries who came in late in the day and were brought in rapidly uh, to bolster NATO membership and uh, actually to provide a pool of cheap labor for Western Europe as well. So a lot of them are pretty gung-ho in terms of um, the war against Russia, quite a lot of Russia phobia there. And actually the lunatics have kind of taken over the asylum a bit, or they have since the start of the war. The countries like Poland, which this time last year were a pariah because of their sort of uh, lack of judicial independence, their problems with um, you know failure to deliver gay rights and so on. Now it's actually their attitude on Russia, which is the dominant um, mindset. But I do think the sort of Germany and France and that are beginning a little bit to sort of question the prevailing narrative. But yeah, they're they're pretty slow at it. And I think the people of Europe are just completely lost. They don't know. They feel completely uh, disorientated by what has happened because the mantra that they hear and they still hear it in the media day in, day out about the war is not matching the reality of their lives. And they really are confused and don't know what to do in that situation. Yeah. And you mentioned a uh, Russophobia and you, you've been quite outspoken about a uh, Russophobia and, and the fact that Russia is a, the primarily target of a proxy war. Now, you have been subject to many attacks, actually. I, I, I just You can just simply Google your name. And I, I found an article from the Irish Times, which I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, uh, calling you and, a, and your colleague, uh, Mick Wallace, uh, basically agents of Russia and China as well, for simply being mentioned in Russian and Chinese media. What do you have to say to these attacks? Because it feels like uh, you and, and your colleague Mick Wallace are, are some of the few in the European Parliament who have, since the very beginning, been speaking out against NATO expansion, against uh, this proxy war on Russia, and also this new Cold War on China. So, so how do you, how do you respond to these attacks when they when they come about? I don't know if you've been asked about them. Yeah, well, the first thing I do is I definitely don't read the Irish Times, which used to be a paper of repute, but actually has become a sort of a I don't know, they must be getting funded from somewhere because they just try and manipulate facts really to prevail a certain narrative. And I think they've become to the conclusion that myself and Mick Wallace sell newspapers. So they do each one out more outrageous story than the next about us and our exploits in Europe. Uh, presumably now the narrative is we've gone to Europe and we've gone stark raving mad. Uh, we're just, you know, in the times when we're, as somebody said to us, that we're on the payroll of so many sort of rogue states now, we must be worth a fortune, you know. It's just laughable and ridiculous. But, um, you know, I think this is, is part of a sort of a strategy. It's a chilling effect strategy. I mean, very interestingly, when the first parliament vote came about, we were approached by colleagues from other countries much nearer to Russia than Ireland is saying, look at lads, I really admire the stance you took. I would have liked to have voted like that. But to be honest with you, I was afraid the way we were de being demonized in our countries was just terrible. We've had colleagues whose houses have been covered in posters who have been targeted, who've been demonized and all of this sort of stuff. It's really quite frightening and it's to chill everybody else that they kind of do that. Um, on the other side of it, the platform for us has been absolutely amazing. So every single day we are approached by people across Ireland and across Europe and beyond to say, listen, this is a voice that's not being heard, which just shows you the manipulation of the mainstream media, because we're not going to be 
silenced into sort of submission. We got these positions. We were in the Irish Parliament for many years. We tried to challenge the establishment there, did it pretty successfully. In some ways now, the Irish media, this is a bit of payback because when we were in the Irish Parliament and they tried to demonise us for challenging police corruption and, and big business corruption, we were there. So when they were given out about us, the people could see us in the Irish Parliament. Now that we're in Europe, they can't see that. So it has more of a resonance, but we're going to keep doing it anyway. But we were on a visit, even that visit to Pakistan that I mentioned, and it's not a country that we would have done a whole lot of work about, but we were in the airport in Islamabad and a man came up to us saying, you the Irish politicians i love you guys again when we're getting on a plane on the way back a man said oh i follow you on social media so there's a huge gulf globally so it's just a load of people out there think as we do i absolutely know that it's just their voices aren't allowed to be heard and therefore they feel disconnected from the system a little bit demoralized but actually if you added up all of us people and all of the countries anyway in the world's outside the global north all of those people are on page anyway. Not that they want to see a war in Ukraine. Of course they don't. But they've seen too much of empire and other wars to buy the rubbish that this is just the most horrific war ever. It's like there was never a war before. Whereas the point we're making is we're anti-war activists. We've always been against war. Every war. Of course we're against this one. But the idea of sending arms into a conflict zone, they're never doing it for you know, for Palestine or for the people of Yemen or anything, why not? It would inflame the situation. So why is this different? It obviously isn't, you know? So, yeah, I mean, how do we respond? We just keep doing what we're doing, knowing that we're right. And, you know, as they say, Oscar Wilde, the great Irish dramatist, said the only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about. So we, we must be doing something right. Right, right, right. No, definitely. I feel like the more that you're attacked by those who promote war uh, the the more you're likely on the right side of, of history mm. and you you brought up uh, nato a, a few times so far and uh, as you probably know uh, uh nato top officials jen stoltenberg and of course the united states uh, represented by antony blinken were in bucharest um this past uh what was it november 30th and uh, during this meeting, Stoltenberg affirmed uh, uh, interest in admitting Ukraine into NATO. Of course, though, the, uh, Stoltenberg, Blinken, they've been saying this for quite a long time and have always prefaced it with, well, first, the war has to come to a close on Ukraine's terms, right? This whole notion of self-determination for Ukraine. What are your thoughts? I know that you have recently been in European Parliament talking a whole lot about NATO, NATO expansion, NATO's record. Uh, uh, you spoke out quite eloquently about uh, NATO's legacy in Libya. Could you just talk about uh, NATO's role here in Ukraine? But also, uh, could you talk about what you think about uh, NATO in particular and how uh, it plays a, a certain kind of role in the world. I'm I'm very curious about. Uh, well, about it's a really it's a really interesting question because actually, NATO was in the demise in many ways, and unfortunately, Putin's invasion of Ukraine gave them all their Christmases and birthdays together. It kind of nearly gave them a reason to, you know turbocharge what they were trying to do anyway by destabilizing that region. And unfortunately, the invasion gave them that. I didn't think that he, you know, he had other choices. He shouldn't have done that. Um, and it was a fatal mistake, actually, on behalf of Russia, because it's given NATO kind of everything that it's wanted, because what it needs is an enemy. And it now has an active enemy and all of the money being spent on arms, a lot of the U.S. expenditure, for example, doesn't even leave, you leave the U.S. It goes to the U.S. arms companies uh, and so on. So it's an interesting one because before the U.K. left the European Union, there had been efforts to develop uh, a European army. And this is something that was in a lot of the previous treaties. But actually, the U.K. was always a block to that because the U.K. was very much wedded to NATO. Whereas other European powers, the likes of France and so on, much preferred the idea of an independent European army separate to, you know, be our own masters. 
And ironically, you would think that Britain leaving the European Union would have accelerated the idea of a European army. But actually, because of the war and that, what has been accelerated is a growing NATO. And you see countries like Finland and, and Sweden and so on and all these. Although interestingly, and I think it's really important to say this, the people in those countries were not given a choice on whether they would join or not. These were government decisions in the height of sort of a propaganda battle and so on. So when I say NATO is in the ascendancy, I don't mean to think that I think they're infallible or anything like that. I certainly don't. But I think they think that they've a certain wind behind their sails. They're ratcheting in the cash now. They're getting commitments for military expenditure that they could never have dreamed would have been possible. I mean, Germany, a hundred second. Oh, it doesn't even bear thinking about the amounts that are being committed now to militarism, which even a year ago would have been unheard of. And that's what they want. It's their raison d'etre. Um, they want instability to profit from, and that's really uh, regrettable. So ironically, they have been actually one of the winners out of this situation so far.